We often talk in the undergraduate network about resiliency, and I just had my own little moment of resiliency where my Wi-Fi went out at uh, 12.59, but welcome. I wish I could see all of you in person and welcome you all in person, but instead, I welcome you to my home office and in fact, to this virtual space. For those of you I haven't had the chance to meet, I'm Claire Preiser. I'm advisor to the Business and Society Program at the Aspen Institute. And I was on staff there for many, many years. In 2012, I had the chance to launch the Undergraduate Consortium. Yesterday, some of you may have been on with us on a different webinar about capitalism and democracy. And a big part of that conversation was about the role of higher education in preparing students to contribute to a flourishing economy and a strong democracy. We'll pick that conversation up today, but we're narrowing our lens a bit and looking more specifically at teaching and at the teachable moments that have come up in our world since the long ago world of March 1st of this year. Indeed, when we issued this invite, we were focused on one event, which was COVID-19 and its economic impact. And that already seemed so full of teaching moments. But now we see in our country and around the world, historic protests around racial injustice and social inequalities. This underscores the crucial role of many institutions in our society but of course, especially higher ed. And higher ed has a role to play, unfortunately, in perpetuating the systemic inequalities perhaps, but also in helping us awaken our imagination and create capacity, especially in our young people to create a better future. The courses we're here to talk about today are COVID focused and uh, our, you know, we will be talking about them through the lens of our public health crisis, but we do think that they help us think about how teaching can address the many crises we face in our society. So the conversation we're having today is anchored in the work of the Undergraduate Consortium. That consortium, I, uh, I know many of you on the phone are members of that consortium, give you a special shout out. I'm happy also to welcome new people into this conversation, given our virtual format. And speaking of that, actually, as we head into this world of um, virtual webinars, we will be doing some polling today. And our first question live now, we'll be asking you about who you are. And oh, it's asking me, who am I? And also, uh, what we might do in person, which is really just ask you how you are doing. The consortium is focused on the unique contribution of the liberal arts to the training and development of business leaders. Uh, since we launched this work in 2012, we've been very honored to engage 85 liberal arts colleges and business schools in a series of annual convenings about blending the liberal arts and business. Now I'll give you a little bit of, of a sketch about the next 75 minutes. As you know, we have two amazing educators to help kick us off. They've both developed COVID focused courses at their institutions. Both courses are interdisciplinary and both were developed at, of course, breakneck speed. We've asked Laura and Morrow each to introduce their courses, talking for about 10 minutes about the, the what, the who, the why, the how of these courses. I want to acknowledge up front that they're two very different courses and we pair them intentionally. Um, it's funny to think about that, uh, of course, there are critiques of both uh, liberal arts and uh, business education. It's funny to think that, they, that there's a shared critique, uh, which is critics often question the relevancy of the liberal arts and the relevancy of business education. I hope what we see today, and I think we will, is um, that through excellent teaching, many, many, many disciplines can help us uh, 
understand our world and and really position us to to make change. So around 1.30, after we hear from Laura and, ah, Laura and Moro, we will transition into Q&A. And we invite you to be active participants of that Q&A. Uh, there's a, a box on your uh, Zoom ribbon at the bottom of your screen. You'll also be able to upvote questions. So uh, that will help us prioritize and respond uh, to what is most important to all of you on the phone. So with that, let me introduce our first speaker a bit more fully. Uh, she's Laura Badeau. She is Associate Dean of the College at Oberlin College, oh, of the College of Arts and Sciences at Oberlin College and Conservatory. She's Associate Professor of English, Acting Chair of Dance, Director of the Gertrude Lemley Teaching Center and Director of the Oberlin Center for Convergence, which interestingly brings together the college and the conservatory to address complex, seemingly intractable challenges in our era. Laura was central to the development of Oberlin's new integrative concentration in business and also, of course, spearheaded the development of the course she's about to tell you about, which is Uncovering COVID-19 Critical Liberal Arts Perspectives. Laura, I'm thrilled to have you here with us. Thank you, and please take it away. Thank you so much, Claire, and thank you for the opportunity uh, to join you all and to share my experience of this course. Um, hello to all of you out there. So, uh, Uncovering COVID-19 Critical Liberal Arts Perspectives is an eight-week course that examines COVID-19 from the vantage point of different disciplines across the natural sciences, social sciences, and humanities. Oberlin faculty members from biology, statistics, politics, psychology, rhetoric and composition, cinema studies, economics, and comparative American studies gave weekly lectures focused on a big question related to COVID-19. The questions range from what is the SARS-CoV-2 virus and what makes it so dangerous, to how can new forms of writing help us come to terms with uncertainty, to who has access to healthcare in this country. The course was a special offering uniquely for high school seniors admitted to Oberlin. The major learning goal for the course was to demonstrate for entering first years that understanding global challenges of the magnitude and complexity of COVID-19 requires a multidisciplinary approach. Relatedly, we sought to convey how a liberal arts education works and why it's crucial for preparing students to be global citizens in an increasingly interconnected and complex world. We also wanted students to collaborate with their peers in a genuine, though novel and very modified, Oberlin College learning environment. So 533 students registered for the course, a number that wildly exceeded our expectations. And anecdotally, we know that for many, this course was the decisive factor in their decision to attend Oberlin. For parents particularly, the innovative concept of the course was itself a selling point as it demonstrated Oberlin's adaptability and creativity, important virtues or institutional dispositions to demonstrate at this moment in higher ed and in a period of looming crises. The timing of the course was crucial for its success. We were able as an institution to respond in the moment to our current moment. We announced the course very soon after students learned of their acceptance to Oberlin. And by offering this course during the period between students' acceptance and the deadline to commit, we also demonstrated our sensitivity to the personal hardship these students faced, namely making a major decision about college without being able to visit campus, meet the faculty and students, and get a feel for the culture of the place, and making this decision one of their biggest existential choices during a period in which their lives were upended by the pandemic. So we wanted to meet students where they were at this point of transition in their own lives and help them feel prepared for and excited about the academic experience that, that awaited them. So academic institutions are not known for acting quickly. 
a number of factors helped us move rapidly to develop this course. So we were fortunate um, in, that, in that the Dean of Arts and Sciences, David Kamitska, came up with the course as a solution to the admissions challenge posed by COVID-19, namely the cancellation of our on-campus events in the month of April. These events are crucial for our capacity to yield. It's the, it was the kind of inspired idea and innovative concept that really galvanizes and energizes people. Faculty got on board right away. Um, the faculty we invited to give lectures were already planning to offer half semester or module courses for current Oberlin students on COVID related issues. So that really helped. And we were able to convey the urgency of this course to faculty because for the past two years, the Dean's office has collaborated with admissions on improving yield by increasing faculty involvement in admissions events. Another important factor in pulling the course together and for its success was our strong peer advisor and peer instructor programs. And in a minute, it'll become clear why this was so important. We already have students trained in helping first year students make the transition from high school to college. So the course was truly a collaboration among faculty, the Dean's office, admissions, and student life. We could see that all the hard work of fostering cross-divisional collaboration, of bridging the cultures of various offices on campus that we've been doing for the past several years is the best possible preparation for a crisis. So this was truly a community effort. And what was really most revelatory for me about the course um, was the sense of community that emerged among students in the course, meaning despite physical distance and the mediation of technology, a genuine community of learning formed. Um, and, I, and I wanna try to explain, I still haven't quite comprehended how this miracle happened, but I think in talking in some detail about the format of the course, that might help understand how it is that online courses, you know, especially for residential liberal arts colleges are still capable of fostering a sense of community. So um, yeah, so I wanna talk about the format and what was important about the format is the way the form and content of the course work together. That was really important for meeting the learning goals I described earlier, for building community, and just in general for its overall success. So here's some details about the format. The class met once a week in the evening for two hours. The first hour centered around the faculty lecture, and the second hour were small group discussions. For the lecture hour, we conducted it as we are this meeting as a Zoom webinar that combined live and previously recorded content. And I served as the host each week. So when we went live, I welcomed students to the session. I introduced the topic of the week, connected it to the material of the previous weeks and introduced the faculty member. Since the course, as I mentioned earlier, doubled as an introduction to the liberal arts for high school students, I highlighted disciplinary differences and continuities in my framing. Following my brief intro, the faculty member then came on live and provided further introductory remarks. For example, what they like about teaching at Oberlin, the topics they teach, or the ways they teach. We then played their previously recorded lecture. Students were invited to type their questions in the chat while watching the lecture, also like this webinar. And then following the lecture, the faculty member came back live and I posed the questions that students had written in the chat. So the format of embedded introductions were opportunities for framing the content and modeling the kind of metacognitive skills we seek to develop in our students. In other words, we demonstrated with the framing what it means to think critically, how you think about thinking. And through the Q&A, faculty were able to convey their enthusiasm and care for student learning. So that's the first hour of the class. For the second hour of the class, the students left the webinar and joined Zoom meetings with 15 other students for discussion. These discussions were led by Oberlin student leaders, many of them peer instructors. The first half hour of that hour long discussion, students discussed the lecture, and then the second hour was devoted to talking about various aspects of the Oberlin student experience. So faculty did not take part in these discussions. The peer discussions helped build a sense of community and conveyed that college is about learning alongside others and through the exchange of ideas. 
the peer leaders who led the discussions captured Oberlin's student culture of enthusiastic engagement in each other's intellectual growth and more, and more generally, our institutional ethos that individual flourishing is a collective endeavor. The peer and faculty engagement I just described were crucial for the sense of community. There's one last thing I wanna talk about that I think really helped, and that is the final assignment in the course. Um, it really helped them feel like they were part of a broader intellectual community responding to a global challenge. The assignment was pretty open-ended. They were asked to draw, students were asked to draw from at least two lectures to develop a question they wanted to pursue. Their response to that question could take any form, video, infographic, piece of music, op-ed, personal narrative, short story, research paper. The student publication of record at Oberlin, the Oberlin Review, committed to publishing all the assignments in a special online edition over the summer. This opportunity meant that incoming students already had a campus platform for sharing their perspectives. So I'll stop there. I, there's so much I would like to say about this course, but I can, I'll wait for the, for the question and answer period. Laura, thank you. There's so much you wanna say and there's so much I want to ask you, um, but indeed we will um, bring you back uh, for the Q and A and thank you. And we are at now turning to Mauro Yin. I'm thrilled to have him with us here today. Mauro is the Zanman Professor in International Management at the Wharton School. He holds a PhD in Sociology from Yale, a doctorate in Political Economy from the University of Oviedo in his native Spain. In his research, Morrow seeks to identify and quantify the most promising opportunities at the intersection of demographics, economics, and technical developments. Uh, Morrow is also an expert teacher. His online classes at Coursera and edX have attracted over 100,000 participants from around the world. He's won multiple teaching awards at Wharton and near and dear to our hearts, he's won our Aspen Faculty Pioneer Award in 2013. He has a book coming out in uh, later this year on 2030, how today's biggest trends will collide and reshape the future of everything. So that uh, definitely feels uh, resonant in this moment. Um, this spring, Mauro led the development of the course he's about to speak about. It's entitled Epidemics, Natural Disasters, and Geopolitics, Managing Global Business and Financial Uncertainty. And I should mention too that you have, you should have everybody registered, should have both syllabi in their email and it was sent last night. Uh, so Laura and Mauro's, and uh, they've given us permission also for you to share those. Um, with interested parties. So, Mauro, thank you again for joining us, and I cede the floor to you. Thank you so much, Claire. I hope you can hear me loud and uh, clearly. Um, yes. Thank you, all of you who have joined in. Um, I would like to share with you my experience in terms of teaching a class that, as Claire mentioned, is different than Laura's. I've learned a lot from Laura's uh, description of her class, and in fact, I've been taking notes as to what is it that I can do in the future to improve, uh, you know, whatever new offerings uh, along these lines uh, we implement over the next, uh, you know, few semesters. Uh, but this class uh, was different in the sense that it was offered for current students, not only at Wharton, but also at Penn. And in fact, we ended up having 2,400 students joining this class, which is about 11%, 12% of all students at Penn. And we had both graduate students, some of them, for example, from a medical school, and also undergraduate students, pretty much half and half. And of the undergraduate students, uh, probably about 60% from, were from Wharton, which is the business school at Penn, and the other 40% were from uh, the other three undergraduate colleges, the uh, College of Arts and Sciences, uh, the School of Engineering and the School of Nursing, which uh, both have undergraduate programs. 
Uh, so these classes started in the usual way. Uh, so we were away for uh, spring break. The university decided uh, in the midst of uh, all of the issues coming up with the pandemic to prolong spring break for yet another week. And I was on sabbatical. So this year, which hasn't yet ended, was supposed to be my first sabbatical in 12 years. Uh, but the dean of the Wharton School, Geoff Garrett, called me and asked me, uh, you know, we've got to do something. Uh, we need to offer the students perspectives into what's going on. Uh, and I right away told him, absolutely, let's go for this. And within four days, we had a syllabus. And it wasn't really, you know, my own skills at uh, persuading faculty members. It's just that everybody, including faculty members, the IT team, and TAs, PhD students, were all willing to collaborate and to help uh, get this class off the ground. So within two and a half weeks uh, from that first conversation with my dean, we launched. The class lasted six weeks. It was three hours of lectures by Penn faculty, not just Wharton faculty, uh, on different topics. And I will describe the topics in a moment. Uh, then the students, prior to each lecture, would need to do some readings and also watch some videos. So we created a lot of digital content. We interviewed alums of the university, uh, well positioned uh, at different kinds of organizations from international organizations such as the World Bank to companies and uh, also um, uh, institutions at the city level uh, that were handling the uh, various aspects of the pandemic. So the students had to watch perhaps about 25 minutes worth of video content, these interviews with alums, and also do readings prior to class. During the class, the professors will lecture, two professors each, uh, each week of class, so about an hour, an hour and a half each, and they would lecture for maybe 40 minutes, and then after that, we would do, as we're gonna do during this webinar, uh, a Q&A segment. Uh, so a couple of uh, moderators would select questions, and uh, the students also had the opportunity to comment on the chat, and those would be moderated by TAs. So we had 2019 teaching assistants helping out uh, with this class. Um, after the class, the students had to submit two assignments. So one was answers to a multiple choice test, which I created based on the readings. So that was a way uh, to force them to do the readings and not just uh, you know, watch the lectures. So I looked for really twisted questions, uh, multiple choice style, uh, you know, and uh, they had to submit them within three or four days. And we also, in addition, um, asked them to submit a comment, uh, about 400 words each week. Uh, and the TAs would read all of those comments and provide comments on them. Now, let me also say that about half of the students follow the class live every Wednesday at 4.30 p.m. The other half watched the recordings. And the reason for that is that many students were somewhere around the world, not necessarily on the same time zone. And some students perhaps, perhaps had something else to do. They received half a credit unit, equivalent to a half semester class. And I think we actually made them work uh, to earn that half a credit unit. Um, at the end, they had to submit a paper, which uh, was a team paper. So we um, allowed the students to create their own teams. They had to select a topic and then write a short paper. And then that paper was peer reviewed by the other students. So we would assign each paper randomly to four other students. And those students would submit scores along four dimensions. Um, and at the end, of course, some kind of a grade was calculated. Um, uh, about uh, 30 to 40 percent of the students chose to take the class pass fail. The others took it for a grade. So that's uh, kind of the, uh, the, 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 the uh, mechanics for the class. But why did we do this? What were our objectives? So I would say there were three prongs. So the first one was we wanted to bring to the students the best possible, you know, the best research available about pandemics and about emergencies, right? Not just public health emergencies, but just more broadly, any kind of emergency, such as those created by an earthquake or by a hurricane or also by a big economic crisis. Uh, but we did bring in experts on uh, public health as well as lecturers into the class. The second big objective was to show what the impact of the crisis was on the economy 
and on businesses, not only in the United States, but around the world. That was the second objective. And the third objective was to explore with the students the broader social and political implications, such as, for example, uh, the impact of the pandemic on inequality or the impact of the pandemic on geopolitics. Uh, so the topics that the faculty covered, not necessarily in this order, were first um, the pandemic. Um, what, what is the concept of uh, you know, flattening the curve? Uh, why does it matter? All of these kinds of things. Second is the impact on the financial markets, the equity markets, and the impact on government budgets at all levels, local, state, and federal, and also in other countries around the world. So we brought in a faculty expert on that topic. We also had a number of topics being covered regarding the impact on business, such as supply chains, remote work, virtual teams, all of those issues, as well as organizational behavior topics, such as emotions, decision-making, attitudes towards risk, and forecasting. How do you forecast in the middle of so much uncertainty, right? How do you forecast uh, the evolution of the economy? How do you forecast the evolution of the pandemic itself in terms of cases and deaths? So we brought in an expert on that. We also covered something really important, which is legal aspects and bioethics. We actually had the president of the university, Dr. Amy Gutman, come and lecture on bioethics. She actually is an expert on bioethics and served on the Obama administration's uh, board on uh, bioethics. And then finally, we covered geopolitics. So we had our dean, who is a political scientist, talk about the changing relationship between the US and China as a result of this pandemic. And we also had another political scientist come in and tell us about the changing meaning of borders in the world, national borders over time and also in the wake specifically of this pandemic. So let me end, Claire, my comments by saying something about the future and about um, how do I see this experience in terms of other things that we could do in the future with online education. So I think uh, the mistake that we all make repeatedly regarding online education is to think about it as a substitute for classroom-based education. And I think uh, that is a big, big mistake. I think uh, the future is in blended in a hybrid mode of education. And I would also like to mention that one of the biggest learning points from this experience with 2,400 students taking this class is that Technology, technology-mediated learning is the only way to bring such a large number of students from across campus to one class so that they can have a conversation about an important topic of the day. So one of the things that I would like to do in the future is to um, launch a class that would rotate in terms of topic every year, beginning perhaps with climate change next year, and then the following year, it could be something else so that we can bring in a very large proportion of Penn students to a classroom, a virtual classroom, and essentially then have a campus-wide, a true campus-wide conversation about an important topic. So let me end with those comments. And of course, I would be very happy to answer any questions that people may have and also encourage people to get in touch with me because many of the materials that we produce for this class are actually available for free on YouTube and on my website. So I'll be happy to direct people to that website if they get in touch with me via email. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mauro. I can't thank you and Laura enough for kicking us off. Um, continue to have a few Wi-Fi issues, so don't mind me. This hasn't happened the whole pandemic, and of course it happens uh, here, but um, and in general, uh, handling this Q&A will be interesting. I was joking with my colleagues that my husband often, when we're having a dinner party, I often cook something new because I'm not much of a cook. And uh, then he throws up his hands inevitably 30 minutes before the party and says, why are you cooking something new? Um, so I feel that I'm doing a little bit something new here and uh, I hope to, to do my best. 
But uh, Mauro, you started us on this notion of the future. And before we get to the q and I'd really love to um, turn to Laura on that and get any more thoughts, Mauro, that you have. Um, to see, Laura, what, what are you thinking about this, the future of this course specifically? And also, what are you thinking about how this, you know, in what ways might this course point to some new directions for your own teaching and for Oberlin um, writ large? Well, thank you, Claire. First, I would echo Maro's point that too often our conversations about online learning opportunities get caught in this binary of in-person or online, particularly for a residential liberal arts college. Uh, you know, people can feel like we are fundamentally throwing the whole question of the residential liberal arts, um, the whole model in question if we propose um, more online forms. So I agree that um, that hybrid, that what's really exciting about these courses are the opportunities for hybrid modes, meaning uh, being able to reach audiences, in our case, that are off campus, whether they're alumni or continuing to reach admitted students. So, you know, we've for, there's no way we can't continue to offer courses to admitted students as part of our admission strategy because it was just so successful. We've also learned that this period in, in, in um, the life of young people, this transition between high school and college is a really rich period for helping them think about learning as a kind of transformation. They're already kind of caught between these two important rites of passage graduating from high school and entering college. And that's a perfect time to experience the transformation of an education. It's also a great way to kind of demystify college so they don't think about it just as, you know, a kind of performance, am I up to it? They've been thinking in those terms for so long, rather they can see it as an opportunity to, um, to really learn about the kinds of things they're passionate about and to experiment with different disciplines. So, but more specifically to answer your question, so we're already offering the course again, um, for the admitted students who didn't sign up the first time. So we have 134 students in the second version of the class. Um, but now rather than being a yield strategy, just thinking strategically, it's an anti-melt strategy. So um, again, in terms of short-term ideas this, this course generated, we're offering five other courses this summer for admitted students um, that we're calling the summer um, academic enrichment opportunities, basically to help these students. I mean, there's strategic reasons, obviously, with anti-melt. And for those of you not familiar with that term, basically it means um, melt is when the students who have committed to the institution, given their deposit, for whatever reason, decide not to come in the fall. Maybe they got in off the wait list somewhere else or they've decided to take a gap year. You know, the likelihood of people taking a gap year this year is pretty high. So we felt we needed to be aggressive in our anti-melt strategies. Uh, but, you know, thinking less strategically um, and more in terms of meeting these students where they are, as I said earlier, they had incredibly disrupted high school springs. We know this just from hearing, hearing from them in the COVID course. So we wanted to help them feel, you know, gain more confidence and feel prepared. And one of the courses we're offering is called Cinema and Change identity, ritual, coming of age. And this really comes out of one of the sessions in the COVID course that focus on writing as a way of, of um, navigating uncertainty. Um, and we realized that this, you know, there's so much uncertainty for them in general, but also because of COVID and they miss these really important rites of passage. So we wanted to offer a course that helped them reflect on the importance of rites of passage. So uh, this cinema course focused on coming of age really is another example of meeting these students where they are. Um, and then, you know, so Maro mentioned a course on climate change. We're thinking of a course in using the same format, because again, the hard part is coming up with the format in a way and breaking the taboo of online courses. So we're thinking about a class on the theme of healing democracy um, so, yeah. Thank you, Thank Laura. You, Mara. Mara, um, Laura mentions this word of uncertainty, and I wondered if you could tell us a little bit more. You're welcome to answer my first question more, which was about the future of this course. But I, I, I wonder if you could also tell us a little bit more about 
if you think that this spring has helped students understand uncertainty, you know, you mentioned like the modeling that you're doing uh, in the course, um, understand uncertainty and interdependencies in a different way? Yeah, so that's a great question, Claire. And let me answer that question first and then I'll say a couple of words about the, the first uh, of your queries. Um, so regarding uncertainty, what I hope that the students learned from the two days of class, uh, so meaning from the two lectures, uh, so about three hours of uh, live content that we gave them uh, during the month of April, is that uh, we all, as decision makers, we're all biased. We're human beings, right? Mm -hmm. And as you know, this is a very important uh, subfield within psychology and increasingly within economics and other disciplines as well. So what we hope they understood is that we all bring biases, uh, you know, to our appreciation of reality and to uh, our decision making. And we hope that they understand that under conditions of uncertainty, especially extreme uncertainty, those biases uh, become even more relevant and even more important. And it can send you in terms of your decision making down the wrong path, right? Mm -hmm. um, so that is my hope. So I'm not a specialist in that particular field of knowledge, but we did bring in two wonderful faculty members. And I think the students enjoy that very much. And uh, by the way, we use surveys such as the ones that you're conducting throughout this webinar, asking people to make decisions uh, during those sessions and then giving them uh, an additional bit of information and asking them to make the same decision again. And you would see the balance of opinion changing in the class, right? As essentially in real time, the professor would manipulate, as in an experiment, the uh, conditions in the uh, decision-making setting. So that I think is the more important thing. The most important thing is uh, to understand that as human beings, we have biases and that those biases, the effect of them tends to be exacerbated, magnified by uncertainty, right? Now to your first question about the future, uh, I do hope that, you know, both, uh, uh, university administrators and students understand two very important things, okay? And I'm going to be provocative here, okay? So the first is that um, a blended education that combines online or distance learning and in-classroom is probably superior to either of the two pure types, okay? So that's the first provocative uh, statement. Um, and the second one is that the fact that we are going to be delivering inescapably some of our education over the next few months and years through the online channel or the distance channel does not reduce the cost of producing that learning. In other words, that if you want to get it right. Mm -hmm. If you want to do a good job, um, you have to spend a lot of uh, resources, including financial resources, but also human resources. And in this case, it's not just faculty, it's also IT. Mm -hmm. And therefore, I hope that we can you know, convince all of the stakeholders in that a high quality online education is not necessarily cheaper than a high quality classroom education. I think people have this misconception that online, oh, you can do it for a penny. And that tuition is so high because, you know, uh, campus-based, uh, classroom-based education is just an old model and it's way too expensive, right? I think that's a myth. Uh, and I think that you can certainly produce a lot of online content uh, for very little money, uh, but oftentimes it's not a very good quality. So I think high quality education, whether it is like in the past 100% on campus or blended, which I think is what, what's going to happen in the fall semester and possibly uh, beyond the fall semester, uh, I think in both cases you do need to allocate a lot of resources if you want to offer the students a high quality education. Thank you. There's lots to unpack here. Uh, that, that leads to a question that we're getting from a number of people in different 
ways, which is, um, and I open it to both of you, how do we create real engagement? You know, you're talking about this, but I think people want to hear a little bit more about it, a real community and prove the value. You know, there's that word, the sort of ROI of a college experience when it's partially or fully online. Um, I don't know who wants to take it first. <laughs> well, um, I think as I mentioned, uh, engaging current, just in, in the example of Oberlin, engaging current students in the work of building community was crucial for them to feel like we weren't just kind of delivering a Netflix series, you know, just content that they could binge watch, but that it was happening, enough things happening live with people, even if it's awkward with people trying to talk over technology, I think created a sense of, of community. Even, even the kind of awkwardness in the mediation of technology means that people are kind of fighting to communicate or fighting to form some kind of real intellectual community. So I think I, I, I agree with Mauro that resources need to be spent to produce high quality online instruction, but sometimes the kind of Again, just the, the difficulty of it um, creates a, a, a constraint um, that people want to get past to really um, feel like they're connecting with each other. I think what helped also in our case, and this is very specific, but we held weekly office hours. So I think students felt like they were part of this big event, that there were 533 of them and it was a webinar, so that made it kind of exciting, but also that every week, I held office hours with the course manager, who is a current Oberlin senior, a really amazing student. And we talked to students about their projects. We talked to students about their experience of COVID in high school, about what they were hoping to do in college. So I think that combination of, uh, of, of um, again, the sense of an event and it being exciting and going live and faculty member, and then the kind of mentorship through office hours was really important. Uh, for building community. So again, to go back to Mara's point, this was resource heavy in terms of time and labor, but really worth it for making students feel like, again, we weren't just putting a series of lectures online and just delivering content. Absolutely. Mara, before I turn to you, Laura, we have a, we have a question about the uh, preparation of the student mentors you mentioned. Can yeah. Can you talk a little bit more about them? I know they had an existing role before this course, but can you just yeah. tell us a little bit more about them and yes. how that worked. So most of them are, are what we call PALS or peer advising leaders. So this is a program we've had for about three years and there is a pretty rigorous curriculum. So they had already been trained in this role, but then um, I collaborated with the um, associate dean in student life and she really ran um, the training of students for this course. So they met, they had weekly discussions about how to lead discussion with these students how to um you know how to address topics that might come up about oberlin's oberlin administration's decisions you know any potential awkwardness so they there was the weekly training um and again what was crucial for this course was collaborating for the for the dean's office to collaborate with student life in making sure these students were trained to do the work effectively and Mara, similarly, you talked about your TAs. Um, sometimes at the Business and Society program, we uh, think that, um, you know, in order to really um, support the business decisions we would like to see, uh, we might need some generational change in faculty. Uh, um, and I'm curious about those TAs and did they, you know, did, did you see them really stepping into this role in, in a, you know, a way that kind of helped them think about their academic careers more broadly or, or how was their experience? And well, uh, I believe that uh, most of them, and we had 19, were attracted to, you know, this class and uh, were willing to serve as TAs because they wanted to learn mm -hmm. how one can you know, run such a, you know, large scale yeah. uh, class. Uh, and of course, to, you know, create the content uh, as you go, right? Uh, throughout the semester. I mean, we have circulated the syllabus, but the syllabus didn't really exist as such with all everything, all of the information in there, 
on the first day of class uh, because the faculty who were presenting were giving us readings uh, just a couple of days before their lecture. They were also thinking about what would be the best reading. Or we were also, as I mentioned earlier, recording uh, 40 videos, interviews with uh, prominent alums. And uh, the students found a lot of value in that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so this was an evolving thing. And I think the TAs really wanted to watch how that was done mm -hmm. from the inside. And because they, of course, anticipate that this kind of uh, learning mm -hmm. is going to become more important in the future. So they felt that it was very important training for them. I think they were also, you know, very much interested in listening to the lectures. It was a unique opportunity for all of them to also be able to attend the class without really having to do all of the assignments and uh, doing all the work. Given that they are students of the university, they could have taken the class for credit themselves, uh, but they decided instead to play the role of TA. Um, so I think the TA is essentially what they told me was that they found it a, to be a learning experience for them. But quite frankly, it was also a huge learning experience for me. I had never done anything like this before. I'm sure. I'm sure. Um, let's stay on this topic of students for a minute. And I'd love to hear, I mean, Laura, you said a little bit about this up front, about this, you know, the importance of this experience to the decision to attend Oberlin. Um, but I'd love to hear more about the student reaction. Were there surprises for each of you about what, what struck students? Um, also, I want to Fold in, if I could, while I ask this question, um, something about the mental health of students. Um, we, uh, you know, in the undergraduate consortium have um, uh, talked a bit about that uh, as, a, as a challenge that existed uh, prior to COVID. Um, and we've had some conversations about, um, about the humanities, studying the humanities as a way to really you know, understand the human experience and can that be sort of a, a help uh, to what we see as, you know, uh, mental health crises on campus. Um, so I wondered in these courses, you know, obviously students are going through a lot this spring. Um, did you find that they were able to participate fully? Do you, did you find that maybe this was even helpful to them? Um, so I know I, I, I threw a lot into one question. Uh, Laura, maybe you can start? Yes, so, I, so just in terms of reading some of their assignments, particularly the ones that we're asking them to reflect on this particular moment when we're exploring personal narrative, they made it clear that they were, you know, like many of us, you know, having difficulty focusing, feeling unmotivated, feeling anxious that, you know, already, um, we know that this generation suffers from a lot of anxiety that was only exacerbated. But my sense was that the class gave them something to kind of hang on to, that it empowered them in two ways. It empowered them by giving them different frameworks for thinking about COVID-19. I mean, obviously, our world is flooded with information about COVID-19, but having a kind of disciplinary framework to think about it and think about it critically um, I help them feel more empowered to be in this, again, flood of information. And I think also just being able to look ahead um, to their college experience, mm -hmm. you know, just help them not focus on loss, on, on rightly so, you know, not focus on everything they mourned. Um, so, yeah, that was, uh, there was another part of your question that I was, um, well, it will come to me, but yeah, that we did have a sense, they did speak to us of the challenges of the moment, but in a way they were so big that all they could do is kind of, you know, fight again, fight for a sense of being part of an intellectual community. So I'm really optimistic about the class of 2024 based on this group, because next year is not going to be easy for them. Right. You know? in terms of all the aspects of student life that are going to be difficult to do, you know, and maintain social distancing. But I feel like they're going to be leaders on campus, again, in terms of their willingness to um, fight for their education and fight for a sense of community despite all the material constraints. Mara, I know your students were from a broad swath of Penn. What did you see? Well, uh, we saw quite a bit of diversity of reactions to the crisis. I mean, we had in the class, you know, freshmen, so first year undergraduates. We also had students who 
are in professional master's programs at Penn and they have families, they have kids, they have a job. Uh, so very, very diverse kinds of experiences. We did include as part of the class uh, one lecture on emotional contagion mm. and on how to manage negative, in particular, emotional contagion during a crisis such as this, both in the workplace and in the home. And we also included um, a couple of videos with experts uh, on the psychology of uh, crisis and the psychology of uh, you know difficult situations uh, mm -hmm. when people are under tremendous stress and they're you know struggling to make sense out of a very difficult situation that is not just uh, affecting them but it's affecting society uh, as a whole. But very very uh, you know um, uh, very diverse uh, kinds of uh, of reactions on the part of the students. And needless to say, given that we had so many students. Uh, there were a few who tested positive for the virus uh, during the uh, course of the semester or the half semester. All of them, uh, you know, uh, were fine by the end of the semester, uh, but that was uh, particularly, you know, um, sensitive to, to deal with. Uh, and uh, of course we had, um, I'm sure, uh, dozens if not hundreds of students who knew somebody who had been hospitalized and perhaps even passed away from, you know, the, the virus because of the uh, pandemic. Um, so the, the emotions, I think, were running very high. Mm -hmm. um, but I believe that the students um, as a whole were very grateful that we did this. And I'm sure that was also Laura's, um, you know, sense at the end, right? Mm -hmm. They were extremely helpful that we had uh, very swiftly put together a class to address the issues. This provided them with a platform in which to learn and to debate and discuss and have conversations about those issues. I think this probably helped reduce the levels of anxiety in a majority of them. Uh, but again, uh, Claire, it's uh, obvious that with such a large number of uh, students that the reactions were very you know, different. Uh, we're very different as human beings in terms of how effectively we cope with uh, situations uh, such as this. And, uh, this surfaced uh, in, in, in so many different ways uh, with, uh, you know, throughout the, uh, uh, the six weeks that the CARAS lasted. I'm sure. So I want to turn back to uh, faculty. We have a question um, from Ray Pfeiffer. Hi, Ray. Uh, at Simmons University. And he's saying, in both courses, how did you help the students to integrate what they heard across the various disciplines? That is, avoid seeing each discipline's approach as completely separate? Uh, just uh, go ahead, Laura, go ahead. Uh, go ahead, Mara. No, 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 please, you go first. <laughs> um, well, as I mentioned, but part of, uh, I tried to do that work as the host mm -hmm. of the course. Um, so again, framing the lectures in terms of, you know, the disciplinary perspective, but also what had happened the week before, um, and also, you know, drawing from the Q&A to think about making those connections. So just to give an example, you know, in the, for the first course, which is really about the virus itself from a biology professor, that biology professor used amazing metaphors to explain how the virus operates. So um, later on in introducing the rhetoric and composition, a faculty lecture, which was about the metaphors that are dominating the media's discussion, I could talk about how metaphors can simultaneously be excellent explanatory means for translating scientific concepts for a broader audience, or they can play a different role in terms of, as was the content of that lecture, um, you know, having a more kind of ideological function, meaning we should ver think very critically about how we use metaphor. Mm -hmm. um, we can use it again for explanatory purposes, or it can do a different kind of more subtle ideological work. So that's just an example of uh, how I work to connect the disciplines. Also, the faculty became really good at, in their lectures, because they were watching each other's, in their lectures, making reference to the lectures of, the, of their colleagues. So that really helped. And then the final assignment, they had to draw from at least two different lectures, so they had to already think in interdisciplinary terms. But a lot of this, a lot of the connections end up being pretty serendipitous. 
um, which was exciting for me to draw out again in my role as host. Your turn. Well, I want to add. Yeah, yeah, the same in my case. So as a moderator, I was kind of trying to play that role of integrating different perspectives. Uh, also, as uh, Laura mentioned, the faculty were watching each other. Uh, so they were also in a position to make references. Uh, but most of the time, it was the students themselves. So the students would ask a question through the Q&A feature, such as, so you're a political scientist, and last week we had so-and-so who's a psychologist, and she was making this assumption. Why do you make a different assumption about this? Mm -hmm. So the students themselves uh, throughout the six weeks were also you know, asking us, please integrate, right? And of course, the students came from very different disciplines as well. But they were hearing some inconsistencies or some you know, apparent uh, disagreements in terms of not so much the analysis of the situation, but more about the assumptions that you know, different disciplines make about human behavior or about how societies work or about how the economy itself uh, operates. Um, so I think the pressure also came from the students. In hindsight, if I were to offer this class again, I would probably try to look for all of those connections between disciplines in a more systematic way. And I would probably redesign the sequence of the lectures in such a way that uh, we would be in a better position to actually convey to the students and have them think about uh, how different disciplines approach the same problem. Okay, well, um, we are at two o'clock. I'm gonna ask one more question, which again is gonna be multi-pronged, and then ask another one that asks you to reflect on this conversation so far. Um, so my first question is about inequities. We're getting a lot of questions in the chat about two things. One is, if you're at an institution that doesn't have the resources that might be available at Wharton and Oberlin, do you have any advice? And the second is, did you see inequities in the students, uh, you know, the students' ability to access these courses? Um, Harris Sandak, who's a longtime participant in our work at the University of Utah, he sums these up by saying, but otherwise, how does online education exacerbate or ameliorate inequities in our society around higher ed? Um, Mara, maybe I'll go to you first for a change of pace. Okay, very quickly, so as to leave enough time for Laura to also pitch in. Uh, this is the problem, I think, with technology, broadly speaking. So I teach about it. I'm a sociologist by training. I teach about, among other things, uh, technology, you know, we have this image that technology serves everyone, that is the great equalizer. Mm -hmm. And in fact, it is the greatest inequalizer, right? The greatest, uh, you know, discriminating, you know, uh, force that we have in the world right now for the reasons that the person who was asking the question mentioned. Um, so uh, I think, uh, you know, in our case, that's why we decided early on to do two things, by the way. One was to make all of the recordings available to the students and not require them to you know, do the class live because maybe they didn't have a reliable internet connection. Mm -hmm. Not just uh, in some cases because of family income or access, but also because they happen to be in some part of the world where the internet doesn't work as well. Um, and then um, secondly, and by the way, this is important, we closed captioned every lecture and every video. Mm -hmm. uh, now I realize that's costly because you have to have somebody uh, writing the transcripts, right? Uh, but we closed captioned every single video for accessibility issues because we have, uh, well, a certain percentage of students who have learning disabilities and they absorb the information so much better they're able to read rather than to listen to a lecture. Mm -hmm. So the same way that we have student note takers when we teach in the classroom, uh, in this case, we, we use closed captioning, right? So that's another way in which we try to you know, make sure that all students would be on a level playing field, right? Including those with learning disabilities. Now, the other issue, which is um, about, um, you know, institutions of higher education that may have fewer resources, of course, 
uh, you know, this is a, a, a big issue, especially moving forward, because there's going to be a lot of budget cuts. And those budget cuts, I think, are going to affect more severely institutions that were already um, under financial pressure, many of them public institutions, of course, in this country. So I think uh, there's an easy solution for that. I think uh, we should partner. Uh, I think we should, uh, you know, but partner not only among equals, so first-tier institutions, uh, you know, partnering with other first-tier institutions. I think we should broaden that uh, so that we can, in collaboration, produce even more impactful and more useful online learning and education. I think it's really important. And quite frankly, Claire, perhaps the Aspen Institute and your program can, you know, promote those kinds of partnerships. Again, partnerships that help pull resources. Uh, no faculty in the world, you know, no college, no university has a monopoly on all useful knowledge, right? Uh, but also in terms of resources. And uh, yes, I mean, producing good online education is expensive. There's no question about it. Um, so I think uh, there's a huge opportunity here for collaboration. And again, uh, hopefully you can orchestrate some of that or you can create a pilot program. Always, always be careful of asking a question that might come back to <laughs> my responsibility. But um, I'm, I'm glad to hear it. Uh, I will say that our theme, we were supposed to be together in person today. Um, and our hosts were to be Wharton and Franklin and Marshall and Bucknell. And hopefully we will do that in person in 2021. The theme we had planned uh, for this convening is what was flourishing and collaboration. It, it was called flourishing together. Uh, so we'll have lots to pick up when hopefully we do meet in 2021 at those schools um, a year from today. Uh, Laura, on inequities in higher ed and what you might have seen in this class and what your thoughts are? Well, we saw more examples of inequity in higher ed, frankly, with our own students once they were sent home and they, you know, they had vastly different learning environments and access to technology and the space and the, the, the space and the peace to, that they needed to pursue their education. So, yeah, we're very aware of this being a huge issue that um, moving to online instruction really revealed. We all knew it was there, but it made it starkly apparent. In terms of students in this course, you know, we, we invited them to get in touch with us if they had any issues with technology. Um, and frankly, they didn't seem to have any. We did um, want to, you know, a gesture of accessibility was making the course free, but for credit. So like Morrow's course, it was a two credit class. In other words, students who completed the class would have two credits towards their Oberlin education. Um, and I'd love the idea of closed captioning the, the lectures. We did, we did not do that, but next time that would be a great thing to do. <laughs> <laughs> Sounds expensive <laughs> in terms of time. I mean, We're all learning. I've, I've learned so much from you so far. I've been taking notes. And, uh, uh, so. Me too. Me too. It, I, I may just say quickly here in case I forget. I love the idea of interviewing alumni and having that be video content, that's just a fantastic idea. We had two alumni just drop in for 15 minutes, um, you know, which was fun, but I think, you know, you can really have a more meaningful conversation with alumni if you record it and then make that available. Well, that's perfect, Laura. You already answered my, my wrap up question I was going to pose to you. So now I'll, I'll turn to Mara, just Mara listening to Laura's presentation in the Q and A you know, what are you, what are you leaving with? Uh, what might be in your notes about specifics to, to apply in your teaching or? Well, two things. I mean, one is how important it is to engage the students uh, mm -hmm. when, you know, delivering any kind of a learning product um, at a distance online. So I've been taking notes about the ways in which uh, she tried to engage the students, the, the uh, upcoming students, incoming students. Uh, at Oberlin. And, and I think uh, the second one, you know, I keep on going back to this thing about integrating perspectives, right? So we, we, we also, you know, designed the class as an interdisciplinary uh, undertaking. So perhaps we didn't have as much diversity as Laura had in her class in terms of the faculty backgrounds. 
But let me tell you, I mean, psychologists, economists, uh, you know, uh, epidemiologists, uh, what else do we have? Sociologists and so on and so forth. Uh, they tend to disagree quite a bit already, right? Um, so that was a challenge, uh, I think. Uh, but that's the beauty of these classes that you can bring in those things. Now, the other thing is, you know, um, how can we, you know, just more broadly use this as a as yet another thing that we do. So integrating it, you know, across the board in all of our, you know, offerings and throughout, and this is what I like, Laura, about what you did, the entire cycle, right? So the cycle doesn't start with students when they show up on campus. Uh, those students have a past, right? And so you caught them at a moment, at a transition in life that is extremely important. And so I, I think that's something that, you know, I, I, I would like uh, Penn uh, to pursue, you know, my university to pursue in the future. How can you engage admitted students, not just for the purpose of making sure that they actually show up, uh, but just to have them better prepared as to what's going to happen on campus so that they don't have to learn everything from scratch as to, you know, how the faculty behaves, what to do, uh, what to expect during the first week right or two on campus so that they come better prepared uh, so i think that uh, essentially engaging the students and of course also engaging them after they graduate right i mean that's the other beauty of online education that it can help um us um you know uh, engage uh graduates mm -hmm. uh above and beyond just fundraising right uh so we can engage them in in, in a meaningful um academic way um, so this is the concept that we've tried to pursue um, at Wharton and at Penn of lifelong learning, we call it, LLL, lifelong learning. Uh, so in other words, that you, your education at our university is not just four years of undergraduate college. Mm -hmm. It's actually a lifelong commitment on our part, right? And yes, education is expensive. There's no question about it. Tuition has been growing. We don't know all of the problems associated with that. Um, but if I think as universities, we can keep engaging our graduates throughout their lifetimes in meaningful academic work, right? Mm -hmm. I think then, you know, that tuition that they pay will make far more sense, right? It's not just a four year thing. It's a lifelong, and lives these days last very long, right? I mean, people on average are living into their 80s, on average, right? And so um, most of our students graduate when they are 23. If we can keep them engaged for another 60 years on average, uh, that's, a, I think, uh, a very different value proposition. And I think uh, many of the clinic systems that nowadays exist about higher education could be addressed if we became more lifelong learning. And for lifelong learning, I, you know, this is one area in which the online option is just, uh, you know, beautiful, of right? Yeah. Of course. Well, both of you, thank you so much. Um, this has been very meaningful for me. I really appreciate your engagement, your curiosity, your ideas. Um, we asked at the front, you know, how people were feeling, and I think about 30% said they were exhausted. So I thank everybody on this webinar um, for coming. Uh, we hope it's been fun and productive. We do have one more poll, uh, which is sort of just a quick quality check on, on this session. Um, I, before I close, I want to thank my teammates behind the curtain also. Uh, that is Judy Samuelson, Jamie Betcher, Zach Mu Young, and Rachel Wheeler. Uh, we've all been on a steep learning curve and it's been really terrific to work with them. Um, I wanna leave you with a closing thought. It was on the intro slide, I think, when you joined this webinar, but I wanna read it again, because uh, I think it speaks to what we've been talking about over the past 75 minutes. So this was from Scott Cowan, who was the head of Tulane when Katrina hit, and he says, when the novel coronavirus outbreak comes to a halt 
and we all come out of this state of emergency, our world will have been changed. The experiments, experiences, experiments, and adjustments we will have made will have opened the door to renewal. Intentionally or inadvertently, we will have begun the work of reimagining how we do the work of the university. So I hope we at the Aspen Institute can help you with that reimagining. Uh, we will be sending you a, a recording of this session uh, that you can share with your colleagues near and far, as well as we'll send you some other resources and ways to engage with us. Um, so with that, I say thank you all and happy reimagining. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.